No conversations or bad conversations? Bad conversations. Favorite philosopher? Daniel Dennett. Or Socrates. Live by the sea or in the woods? Woods. Which social network would you like to see disappear over Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Never be employed again or cater to PC audiences? Never be employed again. Strong. Now, while, while introducing you, I said that you were the professor of philosophy at Portland State Correct. University. Could you tell me what happened? <laughs> um, the organization was captured by ideological maniacs, and uh, I was basically harassed, and I finally, I finally quit. You, you were harassed for doing what? Well, I was, I was harassed for asking questions. What's the evidence for the policy? Should we use people's pronouns? Why should we use people's pronouns? What's the evidence for space faces, trigger warnings, microaggressions? And then I was told that asking for evidence itself was a microaggression. Mm. So the, one of the things that we're seeing happening now is that there are offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion in virtually every, if not every, institution of higher learning in the United States, and those are weaponized against people. So they're used to keep people in line. When you talk, what do these institutions do to keep people in line? It seems well, like they, they're they sort of They threaten them with investigation, for one thing. Right. Yeah. You, you published a really interesting paper uh-oh. <laughs> this, is, this is the 21 or older I, uh, I, crowd. I, I love this, by the way. When I, I was doing some research into you, and I, I burst out laughing when, that was the point. when I heard about the paper. Could you tell me about the paper? Which one? We did a lot of them. The conceptual penis. Oh, the conceptual penis. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I knew early on that there was a problem in the literature. And so I talked to a buddy of mine, and there was a, a famous mathematician and physicist named Alan Sokol. And in the late 90s, he published a hoax paper in this really prestigious journal. And so I said uh, to my buddy, let's, let's do this. And so we came up with this idea. So in this ideology, woke ideology, everything is a construct. So we came up with the idea to say that penises are constructs. And, and the penis is responsible for basically every evil in the world, including climate change. And then we threw in all these vulgarities like custard launcher and just every, <laughs> custard launcher. every vulgarity you could think of. <laughs> and so we, 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 we published that, and then we got a crazy amount of shit for that. So, you know, this doesn't do it. You think it does, et cetera. And some of that criticism was legitimate. And so they gave us a roadmap. If you want to show that there's a problem in the academic literature in certain fields, you need to do the following things, X, Y, Z. So we did. We published a, a, a series of truly vile and what I think is hilarious papers about dog rapes at dog parks and leashing men and putting white heterosexual men on the floor and beating them as a form of experiential reparations and why don't straight men like things up their anuses? Well, that's because they're transphobic. So we published a whole, and we didn't even have that idea. The reviewers, the reviewers gave us that idea. So we published these, these bogus papers to expose the problems in the field. So what are the problems in the, um, in, in the academic world that you were trying to expose? It's, it's, it's the checklist without the, the, the rigorness in research? Well, what the actually the was problems the are when you think that you read something in a peer-reviewed journal and that's truth or that's knowledge, it's just not. It's just a bunch of ideologues or charlatans who are masquerading as if they have some information. And they're pushing it out. It's called idea laundering. So they have a moral impulse. They have something they, fe they feel morally. And they want to launder it, like money laundering. So it, it goes in a peer-reviewed journal as an impulse, and it comes out as knowledge. And so then we make public policies based upon not, not what's true, are not even the things that we know, but the things that really people who are ideologues have come up with. I hear statements like, you know, feelings aren't facts. And that's, that's correct. true, but are, are you of the opinion that facts have more, more weight, more, more substance than feelings? Because feelings are what unite people. So does that discount feelings? I don't think feelings unite people. You can feel something about something or some person, some, so you've been in love and then you're not in love or 
maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse really annoys you one day and the next moment you're you know, googly-eyed. That, those things, are, they change. But facts are statements about the world. Those things don't change. Now, we may have more information about those things, and we may change those over time. But the best way to figure out what's true is to just look at the evidence. So you, let me just put it this way. Right. In your life, especially if you're young, Plato um, writes about this. You have to think about it as a chariot, and there are horses in the chariot. Desire is good. Emotions are good. These things are important. But reason should always be the first horse in the chariot. Reason should always lead you to figure out how to live a good life, to figure out how to cultivate friendships of virtue. It's always reason. It's not feelings. It's not emotion. Although those things are other horses on the chariot, and they play a role. But reason has to be the North Star. Is, is that still true, do you think? Oh, it's more true now than it's ever been. It's a timeless truth, but particularly in the modern age. You know. People have accused you of being sort of um, anti-liberal. Particularly, I mean, you, you were in Portland State University. Correct. That's in Oregon. Correct. It's one of the most... Uh, vivid examples of what American liberalism looks like. Was that a sort of anathema? Um, I, I, not to parse words, but it's one of the most vivid examples of what American progressivism looks like. What's, what's the difference Progressive is not a liberal. Um, usually progressivism is associated with the word woke or critical social justice or social justice. And the idea there is that you, we just talked about truth. You can access truth based upon some immutable characteristic you have or the oppression of your ancestors. And if your ancestors aren't oppressed, you don't have, think about it like this. So I'm a white, cis, heterosexual male. So in the progressive ideology, in the woke ideology, I see the world in black and, roll, in black and white. Every time you add an oppression variable, I get one more color to see the world. I get another way to access truth. So, for example, if I were bisexual, then I would see the world in grayscale plus, I don't know, green. Or if I were handicapped, couldn't use my legs or in a wheelchair, then I would get to see the world, I had another access to truth. Maybe I'd, that would be yellow. Or if I had another access, like I didn't feel comfortable in my body, maybe I thought I should be in a woman's body. That actually gives you two, two colors. So. Progressivism seems to be something that you are sort of rallying against. I'm rallying against the, the, the idea. Well, here's what I'm rallying against. I'm rallying against the fact that there's a truth. I'm rallying against the fact. So, so some people think that there's no truth. I'm rallying against that. Hmm. It's a little more subtle than that, that because they think that the truth can only be accessed, as I said, if you have certain characteristics. I'm advocating every single person live a thoughtful and examined life, that you are willing to revise your beliefs on the basis of evidence, that we can, that there are better and worse ways to live, that certain cultures, that we can make condemnations of cultural practices like female genital mutilation. Um, who are we not to make those condemnations? I'm rallying against the fact that at the moment our organizations, our institutions in the United States have been ideologically captured. And it's getting worse. It's getting wor It's been getting worse for years right now. I'm glad you brought up the U.S. because basically everything that you're saying, it seems like the loudest example is coming from the U.S. Do you see this as a global trend, or is it very much isolated within the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm so happy you said that. So, um, I so there's an Indian public intellectual by the name of Rajiv Moholtra, and I just wrote the foreword to his book. I mean, this thing is truly. A masterpiece. It is 864 pages. Okay, here's the idea. I hope the English doesn't get complicated. The United States is engaged right now in a new form of colonialism. It's a neo-colonialism. And how we are colonializing uh, people, specifically Indian peoples, we are, we are engaged in a neo-colonialism by exporting postmodernism, wokeism, progressivism to Indian institutions. And it's a new sort of uh, colonization. In this book, it's called Snakes in the Ganga. It is truly a masterpiece. It's like the, ne 
the, the, if you want to learn about any of this stuff, the book written by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay describes all of this in meticulous detail. And then it gets back to your question about liberalism. What's the difference between liberalism and progressivism? So liberalism doesn't see color. Liberalism doesn't, in, in, in liberalism we know that there are better ways to live life. Our lives, we know that there are better ways to construct our communities. But just get back to the India thing. So yeah, so it is a global phenomenon and it's being exported from the United States around the world right now. What do you mean by liberalism doesn't see color? So this is very important for people, especially if you're not a native English speaker, to understand this. Don't be fooled by the words people use. So I'm gonna give you an example of two words. They sound the same. Even native English speakers mix these up. Equity and equality. This answers your question. Equity and equality. In liberalism, equality is treating people equally, independent of whether they're dark skin, light skin, trans, gay, whatever the oppression variable is. With equity, that's a very, very different word. It sounds good, like even if you close your eyes, you think, ah, equity. It's, it's kind of like a feeling. That was a finance word originally for how much money you had in your house. Like if you had a big mortgage, if your mortgage was $100,000, I was going to say Florence, but I can't calculate that. If your mortgage was $100,000 and you had $50,000 down because you're paying your mortgage, you had equity in your home. But now what equity means, and this is so important, equity means making up for the sins or the problems of the past by redistributing assets to people whose ancestors have been historically oppressed. And the, there are many problems with that. Chief among those is it's profoundly unfair to people whose ancestors did not oppress anybody. I mean, I'm part Armenian. My ancestors were in a genocide. So you need to be very careful when you hear these words. You know, when you hear the word inclusion, it just simply does not mean what you think it means. It sounds nice, and I'm telling you, this is an American export that's coming to a university, an organization, and an institution near you. Let me tell you what the word inclusion means. This is a progressive word. People think that the word inclusion means exactly what you would think it means, to include. Every single person in, in here should want an inclusive space. We should want people of different nationalities, different sexual orientations, doesn't matter if you're gay or what have you, you're included. Here's the issue. When you hear the word inclusion, this is an inclusive space. This is what that really means. An inclusive space is a welcoming space. You, you want people to feel welcome, don't you? Absolutely, I yeah, mean. I want people to feel welcome. Let me, let me throw, finish off. Sure. You want people to feel welcome, I want people to feel welcome, right. but the only way we can make people feel welcome is if they're not offended. And the only way we can pe make people not be offended is if we restrict their speech, if we put limitations on what they can say. So when you hear the word inclusive or this is an inclusive space, this is a woke idea. And what people really mean is you need to not say certain things. That's what they mean by inclusion. To me, an inclusive space is a space where you wouldn't be oppressed, not necessarily silenced, the way you're referring to, but... Right, that's because they've changed the meanings of words. They've changed the meaning of diversity. They've changed the meaning of equity. They've changed the meaning of inclusion. Well, let's go back to equity for a second, when you're talking about um, making up for past sins. Right. Um, anecdotally, from my perspective, I'm, I'm Indian. I'm from India. Um, a few years ago, I was applying for a visa to visit the UK, uh, which is already a bananas concept to an Indian. It's like, I have to pay you guys money when you guys didn't ask. And it's 400 pounds for a single entry visa, okay. which they may or may not reject. And then when they inevitably reject, mm -hmm. that money's gone. And when I, when I, when I experienced that, I was, I was pretty baffled by the audacity that the past wasn't taken into consideration. It's like, okay, so you're going to come in here, masquerade as spice traders, oppress my people for 200 years, and then I have to pay you to go to a business meeting in London. Mm. What is that? I don't know what it is, but it, it feels like a lack of equity to me. 
Uh, I don't think, so, so when, so, okay, so it's really important to understand not only what people mean by words, but how they, how they use words. So, for example, one of the primary uh, purveyors of the ideology is someone called Ibram X. Kendi, which was not his birth name, and he's very clear in his book, the only remedy to past discrimination is future, is, is future discrimination. The only remedy to pass is to discriminate people, the fact that people have been discriminated in the past, is to discriminate against other people. Mm. That is a recipe for alienating your populace. It is a recipe, if taken to its logical end, it's a recipe for civil war. So in the context of what you're talking about, that's not the way that the people who traffic in these concepts use the word. Mm. I feel... I feel like you um, you like provoking people. I, I'm, I'm sure I do. As, a, as, as a philosopher, that's basically 90% of your job, to, to provoke people. What is it that drew you to be uh, sort of combative towards ideas and to, to explore things and break boxes open, look what's inside? I have zero toleration for bullshit. Zero. I just can't stand it. What does bullshit look like to you? Um, bullshit looks like... There are types of bullshit, but when somebody holds a belief tenaciously or when someone holds a belief strongly and they don't have sufficient reason or evidence for the belief, so if, if on a, like you've put on a scale, if they hold a belief nine, but they only have justification to hold a belief six, like evidence, it's the difference between that. Or, you know, we're, I was just in, in Vienna and uh, I'm just, the whole COVID thing has been so fascinating to me to watch who wears masks, what claims they make about COVID. So, so bullshit, it's not just something that's a lie. It's something that people want to believe mm. and usually has a moral component to it. It's a nicely packaged lie. It's a conveniently packaged lie. Yeah, and, and it's the new ideology, which you asked me about, there's a lot of truth to that. We have been horrific to homosexuals. Mm. We have been horrific to minorities. There's just no question about that. And, and that's what makes trying to figure out what's true more difficult, is because there are kernels of truth within the ideology. But the remedies for that are not to, to go around democracy and rip down statues. I mean, we have democratic means by which we can solve problems. We have judiciaries. And in a functioning civil society, people can count on those. People can p place their trust in those. But right now, we're having a crisis of confidence. So, you know, you asked about Hungary. I'm 56 years old. I went to 53 years old. I never had a gun. Now I have guns everywhere. I sleep with a gun by my bed, a loaded gun. Think about that. I have ri assault rifles in my home. The police have been sufficiently defunded in the city of Portland right now that it takes them over an hour to respond to an active kidnapping. So I'm sick of living like that. That's one of the reasons I love to move here to this country. I, don't have to, I can walk anywhere. I have to own a gun. I have to worry about maniacs killing me. Um, but I think that ideas have consequences. Mm. The consequence of thinking that the whole system is skewed against a particular group of people, minorities. Every time, so if that's another word you should look for when you hear the word system. That's a key piece of the thinking of the ideology. The system is against us. The system... And so every time I hear that, I say, okay, go well, give me an example of, of, a, of something that's systemic. Give me an ex Is there a law you can think of? So I went around the whole country. You can see this on my YouTube channel. And I asked people that question. Oh, the, the system is against it. Okay, give me an example. Well, I don't really know. Okay, so what do you mean by the system? So if you hold these beliefs, these beliefs have consequences. Defunding the police has a consequence. Not hiring people on the basis of merit has a consequence. And it's all fun and games until it gets into medicine, which it is now, until it gets into military. And the people of, of Hungary, unfortunately, have had a recent wake-up call to that. Meritocracy is essential to the thriving of a country. But to do that, we don't need progressivism. We need, a, we need liberalism. I we, think we need equality. We need to treat people equally. And we need to create institutions to allow all people to thrive. Whether you're gay or black, it's totally irrelevant. I think that the word meritocracy is something that um, 
a lot of people now are saying is one of those conveniently packaged lies. Like, it's bullshit. Correct. It, it, it's a concept that, uh, that makes people feel like the harder you work, the better you're going to do. If you're, if you're the right person, you will get hired. But society just isn't set up that way. Um, so do you think that meritocracy can exist? Let's say, you, let's say you're going in for a surgery. Now, I've never held a surgical instrument in my life. Who do you want to perform surgery on you? Me or somebody who's graduated from a third-tier medical school? So, so we, know, we, we know that certain people can develop expertise in things. That's the other thing you should think about. Can the activity be faked? The, the more likely it is to be faked, like the fake papers we made, the further away it is from reality. The less likely it is to be faked, the closer it is to reality. There are certain activities, like Hungarian, you could expose in literally five seconds after I said like three Hungarian words, Kusunom, Bozmek, and something else. You would immediately, you would know that I didn't speak Hungarian, or, or, there, or maybe I spoke the right words, but not enough of them. So, 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 or like playing a piano or a musical instrument. Those things have expertise, genuine expertise. So with meritocracy, it's possible to develop a genuine expertise in something. And in the same way that you would, would want to choose a surgeon, or you wouldn't want me to fly any plane that you'd be on. Mm -hmm. Trust me. <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to fly any plane you'd be on. Um, so, so we know that we can achieve. We know that we just have to create the conditions that allow people to succeed. And those conditions can't be dishonesty, it can't be lying to people, it can't be privileging one group of people over another group of people. We have to create liberal, equal conditions in the society. So obviously you have a pretty um, co combative nature. Uh, and I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not afraid to stand up for what you believe in. So can you tell me a little bit about the harassment that you faced um, yeah, at the university? I want to say one, one thing. It's really important in your life, particularly if you're younger. I feel as I get older, I can dispense this more readily. Was when I was younger, I couldn't talk about this stuff. But you can be combative, and you can have strong stances on things, and you can have strong opinions, and that's great. And the most important thing you really need to have is an ability or a willingness to change your mind. As long as you're willing to revise your beliefs, you can take any stance you want. As long as you listen to people, you're open to changing, that's great. The problem is that many people have dogmatism, they have confidence, they have certainty, they have conviction, but they don't have an open mind. They don't have a willingness to change their mind. And if you only have dogmatism, then you're dogmatic. If you only have conviction, then you're a fanatic, you're an ideologue. So you have to have both. Could you give me an example of something that you changed your, your mind about, uh, something that actually had a fundamental impact on, on your worldview? Yeah, I'm a little embarrassed to say it now, but I'll give you a recent example. This is uh, a hashtag safe space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think this is the other thing. I think it's really important that we create a culture that when somebody has a belief and they were wrong, that that we don't shame them for coming out. So I'll give, I'll give you an example. Or we also need to create a culture that when we're asked a question, we say, I don't know. And I don't know is a fantastic answer to a question. Don't pretend to know things you don't know. Just say, I don't know. I'll give you an example of something a little embarrassing, but I'll tell you, I honestly believed, as Angela Merkel did and others, if we just kept Europe on Russian gas, everything would be great. Uh, uh, yeah, the Russians wouldn't want to disrupt this because they're making money from it. Everything would be, would be hunky-dory hunky is an expression. Everything would be great. Um, we didn't really need to. I've always been in favor of nuclear, but um, we didn't really need to look too far for alternative sources of energy because it had a kind of e built-in equilibrium. That would keep the Russians in line, and boy, was I wrong about that. Mm -hmm. I was epically wrong about that. Well, that's less you changing your mind rather than having your mind changed for you forcefully. Okay, I'll tell you what I, well, I was wrong about, I've been wrong about so many things. I've been wrong about the Iraq war, for example. 
I, I really did believe a lot of the uh, uh, propaganda. Oh, here's something I was, that I, I mean, I do this for a living, try to discover bullshit, and uh, I was completely wrong about the Hunter Biden laptop story. Completely wrong. I was convinced that that was, I was so convinced I didn't give it another second of thought. I really genuinely believed that this was Russian disinformation. Mm -hmm. I was wrong about that. So, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I've been wrong about interpersonal things. I've been wrong about geopolitical things. Um, yeah, wrong about things all the time. How does it feel to change your mind? Does it give you a sort of identity crisis? Does it make you, um, I don't know, flagellate yourself? I guess in one sense, you don't want to be self-congratulatory about it. Like, you don't want to congratulate yourself. It just should, you be, it should just be a habit. So, okay, what's the evidence? There's enough evidence. I'm going to change my mind for it. I don't, I think... I don't necessarily think it's a moral virtue that it makes you a better person that you change your mind. I think it's just a good habit to get into. Right, okay. So actually, can we, can we practice something? Um, Anything you want. We have, a, we have a little section outside, the, the change my mind area. I'm sure you guys have seen the meme, you know, there are only two genders, change my mind. We actually have one of those where you can actually debate other people. So how about I come up with a statement and then you try to change my mind? Right now or at the booth? Right now. I, look, I'm, I'm prepared to make a total ass of myself. Let's do it. And you, you come up with a claim. And, and, and I want you to tell me how I'm arguing badly. Uh, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something else. Okay, cool. Uh, fine. Okay, <laughs> Keep me on me, my toes. Yeah, the, the, the reason that that won't work is because the reasons for changing people's mind have to be internally generated. Mm. And the only reason that that, that can come... I wrote a whole book about this. But the only reason that can be facilitated is if he decides it, not if it's imposed externally. So I'll elicit, I'll ask targeted questions, these are Socratic questions, and I'll do, we'll do that outside at the, yeah. at the thing too. So go ahead, give me a okay, statement. So um, social media is a tool for evil, change my mind. Oh boy, I actually believe that too, so it's more <laughs> difficult. Um, social media is a tool for evil, is it, what do you mean by evil? Evil as in the actions that would lead you to prison or hell, depending on your belief system. So if you use social media, you can go to prison? Well, it, it gives you a platform for, uh, for demonstrating opinions and uh, inciting actions uh. that are illegal and immoral. Illegal? Yeah. And immoral. Look, the, the January 6th protests, yeah. though, I mean... Those were organized probably like, like on a Google calendar, right. which is really weird to think about. Is it, are they always evil or bad? The bad actions? No, social media. You said social media is a platform for evil. Social media is a tool for evil. Yeah. Is it always a tool for evil? There are good things and bad things about it, but essentially evil today would not be able to thrive at the level at which it does without social media. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably true. I mean, I can try to change your mind about something that's probably true. That, that's probably a bad moral decision on my part, but, um, but let's keep running with this. So um, I'm thinking about, can you think of an example in which social media has done significant good, say, within the last 72 hours? In the last 72 hours? Uh, no, I have not been paying attention. What about the protest in Iran? Oh, absolutely. Um, but the people who are uh, standing up for the women who died in, in Iran are now being detained, arrested, uh, sexually assaulted, and beaten by the morality police in Iran. And it's through social media that these actions are able to thrive. Oh, okay. Well, that, okay, well, that... Let me ask you the question, because I'm not an expert in Iran. Mm. Part of the reason... It is part of the reason that these protests have been, been successful is because they've, these clips have gone out around the world, which is exactly why the government wanted to shut down the internet, right? So would you say that social media has some positive benefits? I'm not sure. Uh, we'll have to find out in the change my mind area. We are out of time, unfortunately. Right. Warm welcome to Dr. Peter Bogosian, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, appreciate it.